it's been um, interesting to get to know Shannon Waters over the last month or two. Uh, Shannon has a farm called Hodgepodge Farm. He didn't start out that way. He'll tell you a little bit about how he uh, got into this. But he's got some interesting ideas about um, queen rearing all the way up to how do you take care of these things and try to get them to live through the winter. So Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out tonight and uh, listening to this. If this is worthless to you, you can blame Rick. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So, um, my wife and I have been run, have run Hodgepodge Farm for about the last 10 years. We've uh, run between 150 and about 200 to up to closer to 400 hives, depending on the year. We've been running that on the side, and I say on the side because my real job in corporate America, I was in the medical industry, I was selling capital equipment uh, in radiology and radiation oncology. So I say on the side because all of you know that, you know, Aaron, for, for one, would know that if you're saying on the side, from the middle of April till probably the middle of July, you're running 12-hour days, seven days a week at minimums in order to keep the operation running. So to be on the side, uh, it was impossible for me to do YouTube videos and come out and do presentations like this because if it got out, I'd probably have some questions to answer to my management saying, how are you possibly doing 12-hour days in the bees and still selling radiology equipment? So we've got the ability now. Uh, in October, I made a decision that we had scaled our business to the point where this was something that we were very passionate about and we knew that we wanted to make the next step into and to move into the bee business full time. Uh, in October, I wasn't really ready to do that from a mental standpoint, but I was on a phone call with management and I did what all of us in this room at one, one time or another decided and thought about doing, but maybe didn't pull the trigger and I threw two fingers in the sky and said, I'm done, I'm out of here. We are going to go full in on the bees and we haven't looked back. So when I made that decision to do that with my manager, the weight off my shoulders from corporate America just falling to the floor was unbelievable. Until I had to call my wife and tell her what I just did. Because we had no decision to do that at that point in time. So I picked up the phone and called my wife and told her, guess what, honey? I've got great news. So what, did you close that big deal you were working on? No. Uh, well, we are full-time beekeepers. And there was nothing on the other end. And my wife is not one that's short of words. She is easy to talk to, and she, she's always one to uh, jump right in. And I swore that she hung up on me. But after a few minutes, she did say, okay, well, let's talk about this when I get home. So I had a little bit of time to decompress and think about it. Um, and uh, we, we've been really excited that we're, we're moving forward with this. She's been very supportive in beekeeping as, uh, as a whole. Those of us that do this on a large scale, it is unbearable the amount of time, effort, and mess that beekeeping requires. And you know, for my wife to have to deal with I me, mean, I'm messy to begin with. I, I, there's stuff everywhere. When you're running 200 plus hives, you're always setting things down. You're putting boxes here. You're putting the, you pull in, and it's there's just stuff sitting everywhere. I met my wife when we were in Boston Logan Airport, just to give you a little background on us. That way I can dilute the amount of time I have to talk about bees so you don't realize I don't know anything. We, we, we met in Boston Logan Airport, and uh, when the first time I went out to meet, meet my wife's parents in North Carolina, we were both traveling for sales, and we met in Boston Logan. I went down, and her old man was mowing the lawn in loafers and slacks. And this is something I've never seen. You know, being a redneck from upstate New York, you know, Nobody does that. I looked across the road. The old man across the road was mowing his, land, his loafers in slacks. So I knew this was going to be a challenge, bringing her back to, uh, to upstate New York. But as I said, I was in sales a long time. So I should have put this on my resume. You know, I brought a pretty girl from North Carolina home, married her, and moved her back to upstate New York. I don't know how I did it, but it was definitely a resume building material at that point to bring her back home. Uh, she went from keeping up with the Joneses, like seeing her parents the way they, they, they lived, to more like Stanford and Son back in, you know, in Homer, New York. We, again, we have stuff everywhere. We've got things sitting all over the place. Uh, but it's, it's a wonderful experience for us to, uh, to be able to do this and look at beekeeping as a full-time occupation. Um, one thing, I, I like to always get an idea of, you know, from people, number of hives uh, in the crowd. Zero to ten hives. 
Okay. Uh, 10 to 25, 50 or more. So this was actually an intelligence test. Those of us with our hands in the air that have 50 or more hives, we are the dumbest people in the room. Right? <laughs> we are the kids that were in elementary school that were like eating the paste and sniffing the markers. That was us. You know, there was, if you didn't know it, Aaron, you do it now. So it's, it, it's, it, it, it's painful. It's, it's very difficult. The amount of hours that we put in to do what we do to, to put the bees out, there's got to be a, a, a tremendous amount of passion that's doing it. And if you're dumb enough to leave a lucrative business like medical sales and move into beekeeping, then you know, there's got to be a bug that's there. Um, so I hope that today that we can have a few laughs and we can enjoy this. We can do it because this is a horrible thing that we do. We, we are always, beekeeping is terrible. Like as a hobby or as a, as a business, all we do is we worry about our bees. We're always in a bad mood, wondering what's going to go wrong next. So today, hopefully there are a few laughs while the bees are you know, in winter mode. So what are some of the things that we have to be upset about? Well, working bees in poor weather. That's what we do, right? You, you walk out in the summertime, it's 90 degrees outside. You know, we all try to keep hydrated, but a 12-pack of Miller only lasts so long, you know, before you have to you know, go back in for more. And then you get into the winter weather or the cold weather, and you're trying to do things and work on the bees. So for me, I got into beekeeping, I think, because I like to have something to complain about. I love to complain. It makes me warm and fuzzy inside. And boy, did I hit my stride when I got into beekeeping. I had lots to complain about. My wife does too, but she, she met me, so she has a hopper full of things to complain about. So this picture right here is one of my, uh, one of my uh, yards I was working on, and the weather was terrible. It was pouring down rain, but I had to get into them. So I thought I was real slick, and I put this tent up there, and I'm working underneath them, being able to do it. It wasn't 30 seconds after I snapped this picture, that tent blew through those trees over the ridge and snapped in two. Again, giving me something else to complain about while working bees. But this is the kind of things that we have to go through in order to do it. Wait a minute. What is that? What is what? We can't tell what that picture is of. Oh, well, that's just a, one of those uh, you know, cheap like $100 uh, tents that you throw over, like the side, side, uh, sidewalk tents you throw over. I'm, it, it's raining, it's raining, pouring down, and I'm trying to work in these hives, so I put this tent up over top of them in order to work that. And I do this routinely, and I can't tell you how many of these things I've had snap in half with a little gust of wind and blow down the field. I had one blow 150 yards down the field, it was like a tumbleweed going down the field, and then smashed into a bunch of nukes and knocked those over too, like bowling pins. So, uh, then we got critter damage. I don't know how many of you guys have dealt with these guys over here. Prior to beekeeping, I didn't have a problem with any of these other than mice. Didn't really care about raccoons, didn't care about skunks. Man, once you get into beekeeping, you begin to hate animals a lot, a lot. This was just this past year. Uh, this is you know, a bear that came in and cost us a lot of money. Uh, we probably uh, lost somewhere in 20 to 25 hives you know, with, with that bear. He'll just keep coming back until you do something about it. Skunks tend not to be a, a real big, a real big problem. They're more of a pest. If you've got a hive that you go walk into it one day and they're, they're nice as can be, you walk in the next day and they're just you know they're busy as can be and it's after you, stapling your pants to your leg. Uh, that's a pretty good sign that you got a, got a skunk problem. Look at that hive. You see scratch marks, a bunch of dead carcasses under there. They don't tend to kill hives, but they can you know really wreak havoc on you and make it not fun to work in the bees. Raccoons have been a big problem for us. I don't know if you guys have had issues with them, but I mean, they're smart to the point where they'll learn to pick the rocks up off the top of the hive, they'll pull the tops off, and then start pulling frames out. Um, I've had as many in one night. I've had 15 hives, tops off, frames out, and you know, pulling out and running, running into them. So they, they are a, a big problem. Uh, mice, we all know the problem with them. I don't really need to go into the mice. What else can we complain about? Uh, this is just, again, some more of the damage. Oh, this, this SOB right here is somebody that we all have problems with. And the problem with Varroa is you never know when it's coming. Even when you look at that hive and it looks beautiful, you're opening up and you've got 60,000 beautiful bees in there, you're still worried. So when's it coming? Any day now. You check today, you shake today, you're worried about whether you're going to have Varroa tomorrow. It's always on your mind. It's always a problem. 
dead out. Anybody that's had a large number of hives, this is a terrible penance you have to pay when you have a bunch of dead out. You lose a bunch of bees in a season. Yeah, it's terrible losing those bees and all that. The cleanup that comes up after that is almost as bad. To pull those moldy frames apart and looking at everything and going through it all, it is a nightmare. You're breathing in mold and it's just, it's terrible. Oh, beekeeping is a contact sport. All right. So the one on the left was funny. I got whacked there, and the best part about it, I was chasing my wife around the house, telling her, give me a kiss. Come on. You know? Come on. What am I, hideous? Here, come on. Am I a monster? So we have fun with it when it happens. The one on the right, it's been a long winter of drinking beer and eating pizza. I think I'm achieving that right now. Like, I, like This is funnier in July and uh, June when I'm actually at my fighting weight. Right now, I think I'm probably achieving that. Probably go to a uh, Weight Watchers meeting, you know, late night after this and, and work on that. My joke about Weight Watchers is one that if you look at, say, Oprah. Oprah is giving Weight Watchers advice on how to lose weight. And everybody in here is, somebody's got to be scratching their head like, this doesn't seem right, does it? Because you're laughing, right? I mean, nobody wants to really laugh at that, but then you look at, you know, does, it, does it make sense? Well, I, I look at that as what I see in a lot of, lot of the, the, the mentorships that are out there in beekeeping as well. You have the newbie beekeeper that goes to somebody and they say, if you do X, Y, and Z, your bees are going to do fantastic. Well, then the, the, the beekeeper says, the newbie says to the, the mentor, well, how did your bees do? Oh, they all died this winter. And they go, all right, sounds good to me. And they go on their way and they do, they do the same thing. The goal of tonight is to hopefully give you Kind of a metrics or a way to kind of you know a, a a way to triangulate what you need to do in order to keep your bees alive. I've got a three prong approach to, to what we do to keep our bees alive. And again, you have to take take what I say with a grain of salt. There's so much information out there. You all should have a I say y'all. I don't know why I do it. My West North Carolina pops out every now and then. But you you put your your foil helmet on and be a little paranoid about what you hear. I think it's important to to not take everything that everybody says as gospel. Take what I say, take what you think is good, and throw away the rest. But you have to have some way to, to look at how have you done in the past. Our winter losses have been in the 5 to 12% range when we stick to the program. But I have not stuck to the program on certain years, and I've gotten crushed. So it's a, it's, it's, I've proven it to myself that if I don't stick to what I'm, what I'm talking about today, I will lose a lot of bees. So the, the first piece of it is, our, is clean genetics. I think, you know, by far, if you don't start out with something that is a top-notch quality clean, you've already put yourself way behind the eight ball. Regardless of what you think the best clean is, uh, what the best profile for you is going to be, you need to start out with a really, really high quality clean. What we do in, at our farm is we try to develop some